Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome to everybody, wherever you might be. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, it's, a, it's a special webinar for us tonight because it's the first time that we have had three organizations working together on, on a topic. Um, our first host organization is the Building Engineering Services Association, and in particular, it's Ventilation Hygiene Group. Thomas. They have the idea for this Thomas. session. Um, as uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, we we are also the City Ashery Group, and uh, I'm Ewan. I'm Ewan Rose, and I'm the vice chair. Tim is the chair. And our third party in this event is IHEM, the Institute of Healthcare Engineering and Estate Management. And um, all three bodies have got strong interest in this topic. Um, our topic is the role of poorly maintained ventilation ductwork in spreading airborne infections, particularly in healthcare facilities. As usual, uh, because we plan these things so meticulously, um, we have timed this perfectly. As uh, many of you will have heard today, uh, there, that some doctors at a hospital in Cambridge managed to stop an MRSA outbreak by cracking the MRSA uh, genetic code. So this is highly topical. In that case, the spread of the infection was traced via DNA sequencing to a single member of hospital staff. But the role of ventilation systems in spreading infections is often ignored because it is out of sight, out of mind. We hear that expression a lot in, that, in our industry. And uh, it's also a topic that's hard for non-specialists to understand. Um, it also doesn't help. We've found that uh, fewer than 5% of UK air conditioning systems have been inspected, despite regulations making this mandatory for all systems now. Uh, I think this adds to the problem. And uh, recent analysis by healthcare professionals confirms that the risks of uh, airborne infections being spread by ventilation are increasing. And one of those experts is Dr. Gasson Shaba. And he is our guest speaker tonight, and we'll be hearing from him in a minute. Uh, so just a few words about Gasson, and then I'll hand over to him for his presentation. Gasson gained a PhD in architecture from Bath University. He is now senior lecturer at Birmingham School of the Built Environment, which is part of Birmingham City University. Uh, Gasson is an architect by profession. And... Um, uh, has a wide range of experience in the design and property management of office, residential and commercial buildings. He has acted in an advisory capacity to housing associations, SIBSI and the BRE, among others. His main areas of specialism are in building construction and services for commercial buildings, as well as management information systems for low to zero carbon buildings. He has more than 58 refer refereed papers to his name, and is currently engaged in research that investigates the interaction between technology and building occupiers. He is currently developing innovative research into assessing the risk of airborne infection in critical healthcare facilities. And his talk tonight will identify particular threats in healthcare facilities from dirty ductwork. Um, he is speaking to us from Birmingham, and we are all scattered around the globe, which is, uh, which is great to be able to bring everybody together. So I'm going to hand over to Gasson in Birmingham. During his talk, please uh, please ask you to send in your questions via the text panel that uh, Tim was talking about earlier on the right-hand side of your screens. And we will pose those questions to Gasson at the end so you can all hear his responses. Mm. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be available online, I think, from tomorrow. But we'll check that with uh, Tim later and we'll confirm the web addresses to you all. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our guest speaker tonight, Gasson Shaba. Gasson, over to you via Tim, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Owen. Um, thank you, Tim and Owen, for the time you have given me to speak on this webinar, and also many thanks goes to our colleagues for your participation and finding the time to join the webinar. Uh, I do hope you will be able to join um, the debate and raise issues, um, which will enable all of us just to move things forward. Um, and I do um, hope that this is going to be, going to be an, an, an interactive session. Um, I, I will try and just to, uh, you know, well, to guide you through the main points. In fact, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, discussing the, my research findings um, for the project which I've been embroiled in over the last five years. Um, 
as I'm sure most of you know, that the problem of airborne infection in ventilation and air conditioning is a perpetual problem since the time we start having air conditioning and mechanical ventilation in buildings, um, late 60s, early 70s, I think the Japanese were the first to do it. Um, we started creating a very artificial environment and um, we have not looked in greater depth to the implications and to the consequences of creating such an artificial uh, environment in buildings and we haven't actually looked at it um, to assess the, you know, um, the drawbacks, in fact, the consequences of having, um, you know, indoor the quality environment more or less controlled by machine and air handling units and extractors, etc. Um, so I actually tried to look at it um, for many, many years before I started looking at this uh, particular project, but my interest was uh, becoming a quite, um, you know, um, uh, significant um, following, you know, family circumstances and um, I was of a member of family and friends as well in the hospital situation. Um, I start looking at the, um, you know, uh, the magnitude of the problem, how bad the problem is, and um, I can only record that um, we have um, um, around um, 500 fatalities, according to national statistic uh, audit in 2010. Um, the cost of the fatalities and the disabilities to the individuals involved um, is, um, has gone up uh, to one billion pound and the problem is on the increase as far as I can see it based on the latest reports produced by the Health Protection Agency um, and remain to be quite significant. Now one of the major problems which I have um, um, identified five years ago is that um, health uh, airborne infection is mainly uh, caused by the environment and is triggered primarily by um, a whole range of you know um, uh, factors some of which are due to the way the hospitals were designed um, were designed the um, occupancy rate, um, the bed layouts in a hospital. Also, there were other factors which are related to the level of speciality, and we found that um, greater reliance on highly uh, mechanical services will be more or less associated with higher recurrence of um, uh, infection. If I um, have the chance to um, take you through the first slide. If we move to the first slide, you will see that um, I've, I've looked at um, what I call it here. Um, if I, if you could bear with me for a second. Um, looked at the key issue here. Um, how can the spread of urban infection be effectively um, monitored and managed on a day-to-day -day basis in order to reduce fatalities. Now, this is a very, very difficult question to address, and I must say, I haven't been doing the research over the last many years. I'm still trying to get to the um, bottom line, really, of what caused the problems. Um, it is quite apparent to um, researchers in the field that hospitals um, healthcare facilities are a very complex organization. They are highly serviced and that makes them very difficult to manage and they are costly to manage as well. Um, most of these facilities uh, encompass many interdependent and technologically complex services. There are also a whole range of human environmental control systems um, which include many processes, interactions and interfaces. Hospitals and healthcare facilities are in constant influx of change given the matrix of medical care activities involved and the fact that they accommodate 
a diverse, a whole range of, you know, um, users, including visitors, patients, and staff, and that makes the situation very difficult to manage. We are really talking here about a moving target. Um, my my own observation of one of the hospitals in in in, in the West Midlands, um, it's uh, uh, for Russell Hall hospitals, and looked at one of the reports. In one particular day, there were more than 40,000 visitors to the hospital. Now, how could you possibly manage infection control when you've got such a huge and um, changeable pattern of movement? In and out of the hospital, um, visitors are carriers of, of some of these infections, and how do you actually control it? We don't seem to have any screening system. We don't seem to have any mechanisms to ensure that those who are actually coming in the hospital are not really posing a danger to patients who are more or less uh, they, you know, under immune suppressed situation, those who are coming out of operation or those who have been through some surgical uh, intervention or have surgical interventions might have suffered from that, you know, immune suppressed and that could be the trigger for uh, cause infection. Now, what makes the matter much worse, having said that it's very complex, is that hospitals are in fact a very, very demanding types of buildings. They are used around the clock, 24 hours, 7, 365 days a year, and therefore makes the management, and in particular the maintenance management of services, very difficult indeed, given, you know, the issues of access and the issue of privacy to patients, which really makes it really difficult, uh, you know, compared to other building types like offices and commercial. So, um, that actually add extra burden makes it much more difficult um, to manage um, and that eventually could have an impact on the functionality and the quality of maintenance of both assets and services systems in the hospitals. Now, um, if I if I go through, um, I've actually looked at slide four, if, I, if you move to slide four, um, it's really showing us a, a matrix of four types of, uh, you know, um, models um, based on the demand for management and the, you know, the cost involved. If you look at the diagram, which is based on Bordas and Lehman model, you'll find that hospitals fall under the, uh, you know, type A of buildings. They are more or less um, very complex. They require um, much greater, um, more effective functionality, robust maintenance systems, and that proved to be more costly. So they require more management, a truly intractable level of management, um, intertwined with uh, more cost, and that cost will, you know, spread right across. I mean, when we're talking about costs, we're talking about operational costs, energy costs, maintenance costs, cleaning costs. Um, that might prove to be problematic. I mean, for a senior manager of a hospital, the cost will become the central issue, the main issue. How are you going to, you know, spread that cost? How are you going to prioritize, um, you know, to spend? when you have very limited amount of money, or you've got, uh, you know, a sum of money in a kitty, in a pot, uh, it will be very, very difficult to decide how best you could spend that money to address such a complex and conflicting demands for cleaning services and, and uh, medical care. Um, in, um, when I when I've start looking at the issues of, um, uh, you know, uh, infection hospitals, um, I've looked at, I've actually researched many, many of the works being done in elsewhere. I've been um, searching, I started searching for information from Japan and went all the way to Norway. They've got special interest in, in healthcare uh, issues. I went to Sweden, um, back to Germany, and then to the state across the Atlantic, just trying to find what, what the latest research uh, being done on, on, on the issues. Um, um, in Britain, we have actually let the, you know let the way to to identify issues to do with um, you know um, cross infections. I think we, we probably um, have 
um, the best part of research ever produced about, um, you know, cross infection. But I think one of the problems which I've experienced is that there's very limited research about, um, you know, um, um, airborne infection. There is very, very limited information, uh, positive information, um, which have actually led the way, I mean, just triggered more curiosity in me. I start looking at ways of trying to find this information and make it available um, to the wider um, audience, stakeholders, and people involved in, in management um, and delivery of care um, in, in the NHS. Now, whenever you look at the spread of infection in any situation, in any kind of locality, whether it's at home, whether it's in a surgery, whether it's in a, um, a leisure centre, whether it's in a hospital, you will have three things. It's trio of factors. You need to have a source, you need to have mechanisms or modes of transmission, and you need to have um, the you know the third corner of that triangle is susceptible recipients. Now, the source can be a carrier person who could be a visitor, a patient, a staff, um, it could be an object, environmental agent, substance from uh, hazardous substance in you know, the immediate vicinity, spill it, um, you know, albumin, speck of blood, and it could be anything really. Um, um, the transmission is actually, or the mode of it, um, will be um, dictated by either um, you transmit the infection by direct contact through touch or by um, cross contamination from one object or one object to person to um, space, or it could be it transmitted is through the air which we breathe, and that air might prove to be the most difficult part of this complex jigsaw. How can we possibly control the spread of a whole range of infections? In, you know, through through the through the air. You know, how do you actually tackle it? How do you actually monitor it? How do you actually identify the source? So it's all in the air. It's really in a way that you cannot really monitor or you cannot actually tackle the problem if you cannot monitor it and manage it. And that proved to be uh, the crux of the problem. Now, historically, uh, during the um, Victorian time, we never had, they didn't really have, um, any mechanical ventilations. Hospitals used to be naturally ventilated. Um, their method of treatment was very basic, but it's very, very robust. Um, you know, um, having looked at some of the works being done after, um, you know, um, following the Great War, some of the methods being used, um, you know, to sterilize infection or wounds and cuts is just use basic things like alcohol, like wine and like brandy. I mean, very basics, but they prove to be very effective. Um, and and that, that, that actually does show, um, as we speak, I, I've been to hospitals which having, got, um, which having provided any kind of mechanical ventilation, they rely heavily on natural. These are built during the Victorian type in year 2012. They are still proved to be the best and the lowest in terms of um, the level of infection. And it does show, although it's anecdotal at this age, that you know um, natural ventilation might be the key um, to resolve some of these um, problem. Now, um, moving to um, some of the issues which I've looked at, um, although I, I, I was very much interested initially in looking at cross infection, um, I moved into Actually, um, I've looked at the whole range of research, and there's just a plethora of it. I mean, a whole range of interventions been introduced, a whole range of um, technologies being developed to deal with touch and cross infection, um, and there's there are many many other aspects to do with cleaning as well. But I, I felt that environmental factors have been largely ignored, not least because it's it's really very difficult to measure in such a complex types of buildings or complex organizations like a hospital. Um, it's, it's, it's really for me that when I start looking at the environmental factors, I've realized that, um, you know, there are issues which are 
applied to human physiology, you know, level of humidity could trigger, you know, discomfort. I mean, if humidity goes about 60%, we all start feeling very uncomfortable. If humidity gone below 30%, that will affect our breathing because it's affecting mucus um, lungs and in our lungs and makes it more susceptible to it. We start having dry cough. So it's, it's, it's just innate, very basic observations about what really actually causing the problem. So humidity has always um, been one of the triggers, one of the factors affecting um, infection. Temperature equally um, proved to be very pertinent to, um, you know, to, um, to airborne infection. And I think when I looked at the um, at, at the temperature issue, um, having researched particular types of infection, I've looked at MRSA um, and I've looked at tuberculosis. Uh, MRSA is um, gram-positive bacteria which thrives on a very desiccated, dry environment. In a way, it actually grow at a temperature between 18 to 37 percent, uh, 37 um, degrees centigrade, at a humidity below 30. So as the air starts getting drier, you will have higher pro proliferation growth of, of MRSA in, in, in that settings. Whereas um, in, in tuberculosis, um, they are more or less grow at a higher level of humidity. A TB fall into, the, into that category of infection. Uh, there are other infections alongside it where any increase in humidity above 60% would be more conducive to, you know, exponential growth um, you know, and colonization of, of, of the bacteria um, um, in, in, in the ambient environment and the environment. Um, so TB, it thrives at above 60% um, percent of humidity at uh, and below 16 degrees centigrade. And you could see that, you know, some of these are really at the extreme of, of, of this, um, this, this uh, continuum. So some of these infections are, you know, associated with a body temperature. Um, MRSA, similar in a way to um, um, Legionella, um, where it actually thrives at the body temperature, it reaches its maximum level at around 38 to 40 degrees centigrade. So, there's, there's here, um, there's like a connection here between uh, body temperature and comfort zone um, on one hand, and the, um, you know, um, the process of um, growth um, of infection. Now, <clears throat> I um, have looked at um, uh, some of the research being published by. Um, um, uh, uh, it was the health uh, labs in um, in Derbyshire. They they've done quite a bit of research on on temperature, humidity, and air velocity. And what they they have produced some um, many many excellent papers. What they found is that um, humidity in particular will be very relevant, but the extent of um, the impact of that humidity will be related to the texture. Um, of the surface and um, surface materials and their texture. If you have a smooth surface like formica, um, they are more likely or less likely to develop that colonization uh, compared to, you know, um, uh, dry, uh, dry uh, varnished timber or varnished timber in particular. Is the texture, the smoothness of the surface, will play a particular part, uh, a particular role in, 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 in that process, as well as issues like um, the porosity of the surface, how porous the surface is, um, whether there's any carriers on the surface. Um, um, moisture content will be pivotal here. It's the material itself, whether it's got a high level of moisture or not. So uh, you, you could see that there are, there are in fact, um, a whole range of factors affecting um, you know, um, spread of infection, and it's obviously humidity, temperature, surface material, and availability of nutrients. So when I start to look at that particular issue, uh, one thing that sprang to my mind is dust. Um, having spoken to a number of um, physicians, um, to even talked to my GP, and obviously I had a chance to speak to um, uh, good colleagues of mine, one of them is a scientist, um, he's actually mentioned something to me which still 
um, you know, raise more questions as I start delving into this issue. Is that, you know, he starts to say that um, the aerosol effect, um, the moment you start spraying antibiotics in the air, that is the time when we start having problems with with, uh, with the superbugs. So, um, you know, the issue of aerosols and having particles, airborne um, fungus in the air would actually become relevant to the um, um, now, um, to the process of infection. Now, um, having made some observation myself, um, looking at you know ducting in, in, in buildings in general, uh, you will see that there's you know the moment you start looking at the grills of um, extract grill, uh, you will see there's a lot of accumulation of dust. So dust has become one of one of the major sign of of that there's a problem in that particular location. Now, in a hospital situation, this might prove to be very crucial, very critical to the process itself because of the number of users in, in that particular settings and also to the movement of staff and visitors. Um, you will have every likelihood that a greater amount of dust accumulation occurred over time. And most of that dust will be um, you know, uh, generated by human activities. Um, research being done on, on the, you know, um, what actually goes through that dust, prove that uh, hair and things like a dry uh, skin flakes prove to be the highest in percentage. When they've taken a sample to analyze it, they found that most of that dust accumulated deposited inside the ducting system is actually made of uh, hair which is an organic substance, and flaky dust, of, you know, flakes of um, dry skins. Now, it, it's so, so fascinating that um, having researched the issues, there's, you know, growing recognition that infection in general would rely heavily on, uh, you know, organic matters. Um, MRSA, the nosomial types of MRSA, would actually uh, thrives on dry, um, you know, uh, flakes of skin. Um, so skin, you know, dead skin is proved to be problematic. Um, research being done on dust mite um, equally shows that, you know, um, dust mite thrives on rubbing the skin against the mattress or against the sheets in, in the bed. And, and that, 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 that's quite um, relevant here because, um, you know, for microbes and uh, to, um, you know, to grow, and for that growth to to become problematic, leading to sporadic um, outbreak, um, nutrients are quite critical. So more nutrients means more problems ahead, particularly if you have nutrients um, alongside, besides, you know, um, temperature, the right temperature and the right humidity. So. Um, it, it appears to me that there are, uh, you know, four main factors which could um, lead to um, this problem. Um, now, I have done um, some empirical work, um, it's part of the study to look at, um, in, in specific to look at the environmental conditions and how could they affect the survival and the persistence of hazardous microorganism on a surface. Now, having assessed their impacts and having observed what actually happened on the ground, you have patients who spend 90% of their time indoor, you have um, brand new hospitals, uh, particularly the PFI one, which were designed according to the latest uh, building regulations. We're talking here about part L of building regs. Um, they were airtight and they were, you know, highly insulated with um, air permeability uh, brought down to three, up to three cubic meter per hour per square meter of the facade. Now, if you are going to make this space or the room more, air, more airtight, you are more likely to reduce the, um, you know, level of, I call it, you know, ventilation, you know, um, 
we used to have what we call the trickle ventilations, but really and truly you need to get some of fresh air to be mixed up with the used air to ensure that you actually can give the effects of um, and the effect of, of um, um, you know colonies um, in, in, in the air. So air tightness um, proved to be quite significant um, and it's, it's, it's really something we need to look at because we, we didn't really have you know, an objective assessment of the impacts of the air tightness on air, indoor air quality. Um, and as you, I'm sure many of us, um, yourself, know that, uh, you know, the moment you start making the building airtight, you are more likely to increase the indoor relative humidity. Um, you know, it's 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 very difficult actually to see it. I mean, having been in in a hospital situation myself, having observing the temperature and the humidity with a with a digital um, uh, you know um, device, just trying to work out what the temperature and the humidity. I mean, I, I have some readings which which really very 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 damning because you know you move to one particular room, you realize that you've got a temperature. Uh, which about 24 degrees centigrade as you move to the next room goes down to 18. You will have a wide range of fluctuation also in humidity. You know, you 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 actually you know access a partic particular spot where humidity is about 12. Uh, sorry, um, uh, 42 goes up in the next room to 60, down again to 30. So you know. There seems to be a problem that you know in terms of the consistency in delivery of um, air quality and delivery of um, air into different spaces, and there's no effective mechanisms to normalise temperatures and humidity, let alone monitor those. Despite many of these hospitals have most you know um, state of the art BMS system. Um, there's so much data around there, and it's very difficult for you to make sense of it when you have thousands of rooms that you need to monitor and manage. So, um, it, 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 you know, having looked at all these factors, it became apparent that there's a problem, um, and therefore I moved to the next stage where I start to, to formulate, really, a global hypothesis, a hypothesis, a hunch. I felt that airborne transmission is far much worse than um, cross contamination. Uh, although um, all the research has been conducted so far focused on cross contamination um, and cross infection, my my hypothesis is mainly that airborne transmission is much more serious than ever thought about. And such airborne transmission of infection um, is more likely spread by through ventilation air conditioning systems triggered by poor quality, inadequate internal surfaces of ducting and diffusers, as much as due to lack of robust cleaning of the surfaces. You know, it's not just the cupboard, it's not the bed, it's not the floor, it's not the wall. It's really every single vertical horizontal surface in the hospitals need to be looked at, need to be inspected, need to be checked, need to be monitored, need to be cleaned. And that's where the failures uh, began. Um, having looked at some of these hospitals in, in the West Midlands, and I've been told um, by a, a colleague uh, a colleague who actually involved in cleaning these ducts. So he's talking about miles of ducting system, three miles in in, in Salyok Hospital. And you, when you think about three miles, how can you possibly practically be able to clean that length of ducting? And what technology can possibly be used to do the job with minimal disruption to patients? So there are really major logistical operational problems um, which need to be addressed, you know, um, ju just to ensure that we could actually, you know, start to um, tackle the problem effectively and not 
keep paying lip service to it. Um, if you move um, to slide 11, um, it's really a, a couple of snapshots um, of what actually occurs at the ducting. Uh, you can see it's not just the dust, but there is um, other, other nutrients like grease and oil and, and things which could clog the system and become, you know, hot spots in, in, in to, for triggering further problems. Now, controlling the spread of infection is the main challenge ahead of us. How can we possibly make sure that we could actually control the spread of infection is through ventilation, air conditioning systems. Um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I, I know that um, we have mechanical ventilation systems in a whole range of buildings. Um, one of the basic and straightforward approach for, for capturing these particles is through filtration. So simple, straightforward filters, which will cost you around seven pounds, um, could prove to be a very effective way of capturing any outdoor uh, dust. But what about indoor dust? What about indoor particles? You know, it's, it, it's, it's really not, the problem does not really start from outdoor, it's really start from the indoor. You know, what methods, what mechanisms can we actually use to control the passage of different particles, particularly if you are dealing with a um, you know um, extract system, you actually extract the air from the indoor and trying to mix it up with air from the outdoor. Now, it seems to me that simple state word for filtration may not be effective. Um, research being done how to develop multi-layer filtration or multi-filtration. Um, I'm aware of some of the technology being used or uh, which were developed by Toshiba here trying to use multi-layers to capture different types of particles. Um, if you are having polluted air you could actually capture nanocarbon air particles, um, um, smeg from cigarette, um, different materials being used to capture different size of particles using different technologies like plasma ionizers, um, bamboo I've been told being used as one of the technology here to capture uh, the particles to ensure that there's clean air. However, this is a very new technology and it has proved to be very um, costly, very expensive. I'm also made aware by antibacterial filters, you know, using silver and using copper, I'm sure research being done on, on using copper for, you know, door handles, keyboards and um, sanitary appliances in hospitals and West Midlands I'm fully aware of uh, some of the work has been done by Birmingham University. But um, again, I still think, you know, it doesn't really stop at handles and keyboards and, um, you know, um, um, tables and floors. It's really, it's really got to be addressed in a much more holistic and more more relevant fashion rather than just um, to be addressed in a whole fashion. Um, having also looked at some of the um, UVDI ultraviolet genocidals and interventions, uh, these have proved to be um, based on the initial observations and findings, proved to be uh, most effective methods as far as I can say it, um, because they provide a more um, pertinent um, approach in changing the, um, the DNA of, of, um, of the microorganisms, um, you know, using different types of, um, you know, uh, ultraviolet, um, which will change, you know, the sequence of the, of the DNA. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm merely having looked at the approaches and I'm, you know, having, you know, observed the consequences and, you know, the effectiveness of them. However, I think there is much work need to be done to ensure that, um, you know, there will be no side effects um, and impacts on on end users. As you may know, that ultraviolet need to be managed. It's, it's, it's very sophisticated technology which need to be managed to reduce any 
like the hazards it might impose on the end users. Um, having spoken to one of my colleagues in ducting, he was talking to me the other day about, you know, um, retrofitting ducting systems with with some of these ultraviolet catalysis uh, units to reduce, you know, any kind of um, infection passing through. Um, this is an area where I generally think need further research, but um, um, it's obviously something we need to bear in mind um, when, um, if we want to um, actually to look at a better methods of intervention. So, um, what have we learned so far from all this is that, you know, is both hard surface and ventilation are quite critical for um, infection transmission, what we what we have also learned is that there are so many a diverse range of factors involved in the spread of airborne infection. There's very limited critical evaluation of the spread of airborne infection. Um, the method of intervention some vary in their effectiveness. Some of them are quite um, you know robust. Others are more or less um, you know corrective, and therefore there's a need for looking at a more, um, you know, um, uh, more holistic approach for monitoring the efficacy of these interventions and for assessing their long-term impacts rather than merely, you know, keep addressing the issues, keep, uh, you know, firefighting the problems, you know, we have sporadic outbreak in hospital A, we go there and spend all the money to correct it. It is pure reactive approach to it. And it is very time consuming, it's very disruptive, it's very costly. There is really and truly a need to look at the problem um, in much more um, systematic and holistic fashion to ensure that we actually get grip with what actually trigger what contribute to that situation. Uh, my view remains to be that monitoring will be the key to effective management of airborne infection in a hospital. Having done all the research, having done all the observation, um, piloting um, a, a couple, a number of um, healthcare areas in, in the West Midlands, I start formulating my aims and objectives, and I, I felt that there is really um, truly a need to, uh, you know, develop a more intelligent predictive management system, monitoring airborne infection, which will allow us to, you know, to have what I call it an early alert system for monitoring the infection. Having looked at the complexities of ducting, but ventilation, air conditioning it becomes apparent to me that you cannot really do it in two days. You've got to look at a more um, sophisticated methods of um, building information system based on um, purpose-built 3D building information modeling. And that will allow us to, you know, to see situation in real-time fashion, um, and also to allow us to monitor hotspots areas where you suspect that you will have higher chance of colonization. Simple, straightforward, common sensible approach here uh, can be applied. Looking at T-junctions, looking at diffusers, looking at intersection of ducts, um, um, looking at areas where you really have a larger surface area, uh, including, you know, uh, parts of the system, or, uh, part of um, the air handling units, and areas where you're actually mixing fresh with recycled um, uh, recirculated air. Um, if we could monitor, um, when I said these objectives, I felt well we could we could um, look at the developing the intelligent system. We could look at an alert system based on a simple, straightforward traffic-like mechanisms. Then we could make that information available in a very user-friendly fashion to be easily accessible by everybody working in hospitals, you know, senior managers, maintenance, facilities managers, asset managers. The whole team has to be aware of it 
so you will have the opportunity to raise the alarm prior to the you know reaching that critical point it's really the critical point which matter here and for that you need to be more proactive in in you know in in, in monitoring situation and tackling it yeah you know and tackling it and uh, in time it's a real time monitoring rather than just relying on data fed to the BMS system which might prove to be obsolete um you know um, subsequently effectively um now um uh, having looked at um you know the issues and piloted um a model which I have developed um I, I can only comment on the preliminary data which we have gathered. Now, my model has been developed based on four factors, and I, I can only show a snapshot of some of the uh, data which I have um, used in order to develop that model. I start looking at, initially, start looking at the failure risk. Um, strategy for managing, um, you know, um, failures in hospitals relied on the um, the three D. In fact, you know, um, three by three matrix developed by the NHS, um, where you have, could actually assess the risk in terms of the level of harm. So you have, you know, um, an ordinal scale of slightly, moderately, extremely harmful, um, and then you juxtapose this against the likelihood of, of harm could be very unlikely, unlikely, and likely. Uh, this is a very straightforward 3 by 3 uh, matrix which will give us an early indication about the level of risk involved. So number one, if you have one by one that will give you one, one indicate that there is a very lower risk whereas Three by three will give you, you know, um, give you nine, which indicate a higher level of risk. So you have one which can be presented in, in green to show, well, it's okay, don't worry about it. Whereas nine will be more uh, likely to raise the alarm and to make you, um, you know, what well, force the uh, um, the FM facilities managers uh, to take action once you realize this. There's a risk there, it's higher risk, and extremely harmful, then you know that you need to make a move. Now, in developing my model, um, I've actually looked at these four factors, um, temperature, humidity, dust accumulation, air velocity. Um, these factors are, um, are quite, um, they're interrelated. Um, um, instead of going for a matrix of 353, three, I've felt that we need just to widen that, uh, you know, that matrix into 5 by 5. So I start looking at um, having a system based on, you know, five categories of alert, um, starting with the green, end up with a violet, and also I actually incorporated, um, if you look at slide, um, I think I've moved from 21, 22. Slide 22 is actually show you uh, the range of temperature, humidity, dust accumulation, air velocity, and you will find in the bracket in parentheses below it numbers one, two, three, four, five uh, for temperature. As you move to the second line, um, second row, you have two, four, six, eight, ten. I've actually doubled this cause for the risk. This is mainly based on theory. Um, the humidity is much more greater or has much greater risk than temperature. Um, in so doing, I've actually exercised what I call a subjective assessment of risk involved. So um, if you treat temperature as, um, put it as a category of one to five, humidity will be much more greater in terms of its severity, so it will take almost double the impact, some um, two to ten. Dust accumulation will be um, the third. Uh, it will be uh, um, triple that the risk in many ways. So it will have 
3 to 12. Air velocity is linking directly to dust accumulation. The greater is the velocity of the air, more likely um, dust will be shifted around. That means it's not going to settle on the surface and therefore it will take the highest score compared to temperature, humidity and dust. So I end up developing a matrix which is based on 5 by 5 and the cells extends from 1 to 20. Um, that has actually been um, refined further. I'm, I'm merely trying to give an example of how this system actually work that um, in, in, you know, um, you monitor spots, hot spots in inducting air conditioning and ventilation system, and you start, um, in fact, you know, um, establishing, identifying schools, and you sum up these schools, and you end up with a grand total and sum of schools. Again, you know, um, the system, as you could see, is based on five categories. The scores vary from one to 50, um, within the range of one to 10, you have insignificant risk, um, as you move from 11 to 15, lower risk, both um, categories fall under acceptable or tolerable risk. From 15 to 29, in fact, 15 to 30, your level of risk will increase gradually, so you'll have a medium level of risk, which is tolerable. Tolerable is very subjective. Hey, you need to intervene as you reach that level. You shouldn't really reach that level. But it all depends on the whereabouts of that risk, whether it's in intensive care unit, whether it's in operating theatres, or whether it's in, you know, um, alternative work. It all depends on the risk associated with the, you know, critical health area. Some areas are more risky than others. Some areas are more prone to cross infection than others, merely because they are relying more heavily on ventilation um, and mechanical ventilation air conditioning. So the more services uh, supplemented to support that space, that clinical space, the more likely, uh, it's more likely that you will have problems. And also it depends on the, you know, the type of the medical intervention, certain medical um, intervention, certain surgeries um, are, require, um, you know, you know, as you start cutting through you will have every chances of bacteria getting into the system. So it's the lengthy duration, the type of surgery, and, you know, the physiological characteristics of the individual involved. You know, if you're dealing with um, an elderly uh, person or a child, you are more likely to have problems than if you're dealing with somebody who's very well, uh, healthy and fit. So there are factors which you need to look at, and that should really be bore in mind in a way. Um, for us to implement that model, we need to have better communication between medical staff and, you know, our certain facilities managers. They have to work in tandem just to ensure that, you know, they share the information and they arrive at the right decisions in terms of assessing criticality. Now, as you could see, this model could be um, used, and I'm, I'm still calibrating, um, working with uh, several census companies trying to um, to ensure that we could have the pilot completed, sensors being embedded into these critical areas, um, you know, to collect some, you know, preliminary data which we could analyze to validate and, um, um, you know, um, refine the model further. But my, my hunch as we speak is that we will have something in hand which will allow us to monitor and to assess um, you know, um, criticality. It allows us to have a better, uh, you know, um, chance of predicting um, infection. And by so saying, I mean, I'm talking about predictive uh, infection control model. That's what we, I think, what we are really lacking in, in all these um, gigantic hospitals we have. In, 21st century. And, and I think there's something which I'm, I'm, I'm really very keen and passionate about, um, you know, trying to move things forward, um, because I do feel that this might might provide us with better tool in, um, you know, um, detecting and monitoring the situation. 
and you know provide us an early with an early alarm system which might prove to be pivotal and um, you know in saving life and I'm, I'm merely using slide 24 I'm using the term we need to move forward to have not just a, a very complex highly service technologically driven hospitals we need to have a more intelligent approach to safety by design and safety through more judicious um, environmental intervention if we could tackle the spread of airborne infection initially that would put us in much better position to tackle cross infection we need to tackle both we can't you know, just say we can tackle one of them and, and, um, you know, we're running out of time here and we've got some nice questions waiting for you so sure. are you able to wrap up in a few seconds? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah great um I think I think I have I've already covered um you know most of the points which I felt um, um I was like you know I wanted to share with, with colleagues so by all means I mean um, I think the information are available for 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 our colleagues to look at but by all means if there's any questions I was more than happy to address Okay, okay, Gaston, thank you very much for a, an incredibly comprehensive presentation, and it's a very, very important and interesting area. As I said, um, people have obviously been paying attention to what you've been saying. We've got quite a, a number of questions that have come in um, while you were talking. Um, one uh, from Gordon Sharp is interesting. He said, surely you will only get bugs growing on the extract ductwork, and if you have air going at three... Uh, three meters per second plus away from the rooms. How does the infection get spread around? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, if, if the, the issue of spread is, I think there's so much can be said here about the spread of infection. I mean, of course, we need to monitor that spread. It's 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 really a question of looking at providing um, better thermodynamics modeling we need to trace those uh, you know those infection how they spread in an extract system yeah. now if 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 um, the infection spread through the system itself you have a chance that that could lead to a further cross infection on the surface it's really depending on what temperature we are dealing with here what level of relative humidities we are having that particular spot of that particular section of the ducting system and whether there is any accumulation of dust precipitating on the surface now yeah although you will extract it outside the hospital or outside you know that that segment that, that part of the ducting there's no there's no way we could actually tell whether that infection is actually being thrown outside i mean you know you need to monitor to be able to see things better so, I mean, I can see where 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 um, my colleague's coming from, but you know, you, you do need to look at you know the manual details of issues. You know what actually happened. In, you know, in that particular area. Um, and I, well, as I've said, I mean, in my my view is yes, if you increase the uh, the air velocity, increase the air change per hour, in a sense. Um, you are going to deliver the effects. You are going to reduce the number of microbes or the number of micro microbes, in, you know, in the air. But you still need to measure it. You still need to monitor it. You know, Absolutely, can't, yeah. I can't see how we could do it just, you know, um, without without adopting more objective and scientific methods of and gathering monitoring. more data. Yeah. Thanks, Gaston. I mean, we've got, a, we've got a, a question from Glenn Ward. I'd like to thank Glenn. Glenn sent in about three questions while we were we were going, so um, sure. de definitely deserves to, be, to have one answer. His actual third one, I'll post his third one because it's, uh, it goes right to the heart of the matter. He sure. said, um, Glenn said, I've just completed a School of Healthcare CPD. Uh, it's a specialised ventilation and healthcare premises uh, course, I guess he's talking about. He said the course failed to address inspection, testing, cleaning, and cross-infection risks associated with dirty ducting. He actually said that the course director dismissed his question when he asked about that, saying um, that ducts do not need cleaning. 
and he made a derogatory oh. comment about ventilation hygiene companies. Now, I can you hear this is alarming. This must be alarming, you guys. How can I, we? I, 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 I can't, I can't believe that. I know, Sorry, it shouldn't either. But he said his, Glenn's question is, how can we as an industry re-educate those that are responsible for not only delivering this training, but also for carrying out NHS hospital inspections and verifications? Big, big question there, I guess. On, <laughs> I'm, I'm very much I know, I mean, I'm, I, I think, I think we, we need to tackle the problem um, in more holistic fashion. It's, it's really a cradle to grave approach which we need to put in place. Um, there's a whole range of service providers for cleanings in Britain. Um, in Great Britain, we have very dedicated um, companies, and I, I met some of the teams involved in these companies. Now, they were all complaining about, well, we are involved in cleaning, we are doing a good cleaning, yet there is very limited, limited, um, you know, um, amount of money is available to do the cleaning. Um, the NHS are not managers are not really very much. Um, although they wanted to do all the cleanings, they are they having got the monies really um, to do all the cleanings. So there's a limitations in the way the you know, hospital budget is actually distributed. So I think w we need to tackle the problem at different levels. At legislation level, we need to ensure that we have you know um, you know hospital providers have you know duty of care. What legal obligations to ensure that cleaning is actually conducted on a regular basis, six monthly to yearly basis, based on the criticality of the you know situation, whether criticality uh, could be the area itself or the part of the ducting system where the cleaning has become of paramount importance. So you need to tackle it at the legislation level or building regs. Sorry. Also, you need to you know have I think have more training for senior managers um, to realize the gravity and the extent of the problem. I think realization can only occur through these seminars and webinars. I think if, if any of the managers look at what actually goes inside a duct, a clogged duct, you or she will actually see that there's a problem. You can't just dismiss it. Well, it's relevant. I think, you know, it, because they are out of sight, out of mind, I think that's part of the problem. So we need to bring the problem, you know, to the to the to the um, attention of those actually involved in. Okay. In Thank, thanks, Kessler. Thank you. Thank you. That's clear, uh, clear point, clear clear answer there. Um, I'd like to also bring in a question from Ian Wall. Ian is uh, from Duckbusters, and I know you know him very well, Gasson. He was also it's his idea to um, to get to get you to give this presentation. Ian's part of the BNDS Ventilation Hygiene Group. That's Ian right. was saying that he was reading in Health Estates Journal, uh, which I know you've written for, Gasson, that sure. in Germany, 15,000 patients die each year due to catching infections in hospital. Ian's asking, are there any comparable figures for the UK? And is airborne transmission a factor? Well, I think we have, we have in fact, um, um, I think overall, well, I don't think we have that kind of, um, you know, segmentation here. I mean, what we have is that we have uh, reports being produced on an annual basis by the health protection agencies. There are some data which shows the number of fatalities in different wards and different, uh, you know, um, specialities, uh, and I just trust specialities, um, um, related to health care acquired infection. Um, I mean, they actually, you know, agglomerate you know, all the data in, in one lump where you could actually have a figure that shows that how many patients have actually died um, due to um, healthcare acquired infection. Um, I think this is, this is part of the problem because we don't seem to have a clear cut objective data about fatalities attributed mainly to airborne infection. Um, we don't have the, you know, um, clear cut evidence really, because they are all, you know, um, all um, summed up in one, one, one lump, one, one figure. Uh, I think perhaps um, once we um, we are uh, conducted um, and completed the party study and start building on um, further uh, follow up studies, 
we might be able to to get more insights into the problem. I'm sure um, I've spoken to him before, and I'm sure you know. Uh, and I think part of the problem is that you know <laughs> hospitals will be reluctant to tell you. Uh, it, it's just one one of the problems that we. I don't think we've got much, um, you know, greater transparency here. Just to show the actual figure, um, you cannot actually say, well, this fatality is attributed to complicated surgery, or it is it, attributed to um, a cross infection or airborne infection. It's it's very difficult to uh, to ascertain the facts, and and I think that's 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 one of the problems we actually have. Um, and I have no answer to be quite honest with you. I mean, I cannot. Um, work out, although I, I think um, when I started doing this research, I've looked at, I looked at the situation in Germany and in Norway and Japan. I think they've got much more better transparency in terms of the actual statistics and, you know, pinpointing to where um, the problem is and what contribution each, each type of these um, infections have actually uh, made in relation to the overall sum. Okay, th thank you for that, Gaston. Um, one very specific question from Glenn, from Glenn Ward again. Uh, he was just asking, um, what disinfectant would you recommend for killing gram-positive bacterial spores in ventilation oh. duct work? Well, the I'll most tell effective you. method of uh, application. My method. Well, I mean, I'll tell you. I, I, I. Of course, I'm an FM. I'm an architect, but I do a lot of FM work, and I'm, I, you know, um, most of the work. Uh, Used to do in the past is just you know firefighting, just reacting to the problems and trying to provide you know a clear, sharp, robust approach to tackle it. My view is you, you would be better off in controlling the temperature. It's like with legionella, you know, um, you know you will have legionella whenever you had a dead legs, whenever you had stagnant water in in a section of your pipe wasn't running for a week, you are more likely to have the problem. So you need to look at prevention. I, I believe in prevention because I think prevention, as it says, is the mother of all cure. You've got to prevent the problem from occurring on the first place by merely watching for temperature range and humidity. For the MRSA, you need to watch out for, you know, dryness of the air. You know, drier air lower than 30% will be more conducive. So, by merely regulating the relative humidity of the air, um, bring it up to 45 50% humidity, you are lessening, you are reducing the impact of it. Equally, you need to look at the range of temperature. I mean, you walk in many of these places where, you know, it's really stuffy, it's very hot. You know, I, I had measures of 24, 25 in some spots. Now, you need to bring that figure down to 22 or to 20, so by merely going to the other ends, because MRSA thrives at a range of 18 to 24. So if you bring it closer to 18, you are more likely to reduce the impacts um, of it. And, and I, I think it, it, it's really trying to be ahead of the ball game. You're trying to be more proactive in looking at the environmental parameters and their impacts on the colonization process by by tweaking and you know changing the temperature and humidity range and you will be more able to control it. Now even if you've done that I think cleaning remains to be pivotal here. You need to look at how clean the ducts are and I think you can't just do it you know um, in haphazard fashion. You need to be able to you know um to locate, to identify these hot spots. Um, so your cleaning bill is not going to go higher up. You, you've got to spend money, but you've got to spend money wisely in the right place to ensure that they are, they are properly um, cleaned. I'm, I'm probably not in a position to advise on any, any um, you know, um, method, specific method of cleaning, but. Um, you know, if, if Anglin wished to uh, email me, um, I might be able to put them in, in the right direction. If somebody else might be able to to assist in, in, in this respect. Okay, no, that's that's a possibility. People can always follow up afterwards with this. We're going we're going to wrap up in a minute, Gaston. I just and um, Glenn, uh, as I said, Glenn Ward's been contributing a lot, and he just had one question. I'm not sure there is an answer to this. 
Um, it was something I was going to ask. Do we have figures about hospitals that have been prosecuted for negligence um, and failing to safely maintain ventilation systems? Is this information available? I, I guess probably not. Is that, no, is that right? I, my answer is no. no I think um, it's, it's, it's one of the... Uh, Sorry, it's it's one of one of the problems which I um I've actually experienced myself. I mean, access to data has proved to be problematic, but um, I think um, you know um, as we start raising awareness and make the issues um, available to the wider um, audience and to um, stakeholders and hospital managers, we might be able to start you know finding a way through this um living effect all uh, data proved to be problematic um but i think the best we can have for is really um you know to create a um, much more greater awareness about the gravity and okay so, well well, okay, so that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. you. You're doing great work there. And, and I, you know, we'd, I think we all wish you luck with getting this system in place. Um, we, we're going to wrap up there. We, we would all give you a round of applause if we could, if, if we were all together. I'd buy you a beer if you weren't in Birmingham. But uh, oh, thank, you for, thank you. We will do when we get together. Um, thank you very much, Gasson. Um, this, that webinar has been recorded and will be on the Sibsi Ashray website, which is sibsiashray.org from Friday, I am, I'm assured. So if you want to listen to it again or, or check out the slides, sibsiashray.org is where you go. We will also be putting a link to it from the BNDS uh, website, www.b-es.org. Um, Tim has put a message up saying if you want a CPD certificate from this session, there's a link there, and um, hopefully you can all see that on your chat panel, the website. There's a link there if you do need a CPD certificate. Um, thanks to Gaston again. Our next presentation, Sipsiashri Group presentation, is on Wednesday.